You are now listening to Chakras and Shotguns. Welcome back to Chakras and Shotguns. This is episode 48. I'm Mick. And I'm Jen. Welcome back. How's it going? It's going. I feel like this week has been really, really exceptionally busy. I had my retreat that I planned for the inner victory over the weekend. So it was a men's retreat all about healing. We did some ceremonies. We had a hike at this state natural area called Enchanted Rock, which is an ancient Native American site where it was, you know, very sacred to the Native American folks who lived in that region of Texas. So it was great to just kind of experience that and connect with nature. Had some really good food from a chef that we brought in. And just a lot of moments of brotherhood. So really just a, a great weekend. So, you know, lots of work went into that planning for it and I'm on the other side of it now. I'm feeling very relieved that it went really well. <laughs> it looked fantastic. I was holding down the fort. Yes, I appreciate that. The two littles were very good. They were very good, which they needed to be <laughs> to be supportive <laughs> of what you were trying to accomplish. Yes, indeed. Super proud of you. From what you've told me, it sounded like you curated precisely who needed to be there. Mm -hmm. Everyone was open to the experience, which yeah. I think doing a men's retreat, there is fear, we'll get into that, of men being able to be vulnerable and being open and being open with other men that they don't, they may not know very well. Yeah. So I commend you seriously for creating a space for that because i think it's really valuable work that you're doing and can't wait to see the next one i was mad about that food though because the food looked amazing <laughs> and i wanted some yes indeed we are going to do another one the plan is to have these every six months that's kind of what i'm thinking right now okay so go to the innervictory.com and you will you can sign up to join our email list and we will let you know as more of them unfold. Me and the kids are gonna come to the next one. We just gonna be in a different house, but I'm gonna I'm gonna swing by and give me a plate because that, <laughs> that food looks so good. <laughs> it was healthy. In my world, I'm trying to get into my fitness and do a little bit better. And you know, my dreams of a summer body are um I know they're dreams. Well, <laughs> Don't play yourself. Maybe not. Maybe I can manifest. But speaking of, the reason why I'm bringing this up is, so everyone knows that listens to the podcast that I love yoga and I try and practice when I can, which is, which can be hard to like really make yourself get on the mat. But I've been trying to incorporate some other things into my workouts. Of course, look, if, if anybody saw Lori Harvey, you know, she put on some relationship weight, self-admittedly, okay? She got she got with Michael and was eating breads and <laughs> feeling sassy and was in love. And so she decided to, like, do some workout plan, but she does Pilates. So I've done the machine Pilates. It will kick your ass, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, it was hard for me to sit on the toilet. Like, that's how sore I was mm. when I did it for, like, a week <laughs> I never get to the other side of soreness. I have to do better about that. But I don't really like, I don't love working out. That's what I would have said in the past. I say all of this to say that I'm trying to do Pilates, do yoga, do more cardio. I'm like, we dusted off the Peloton so I could like get back on that thing before we, because <laughs> we were thinking about selling it because <laughs> no one was using it. But what I've started to incorporate is affirmations while I'm working out in those moments where I'm like, this sucks. <laughs> and I want to be like, oh, I hate this. Instead, I say, I love working out. I feel so good. I'm going to feel so good when I'm done with this. And initially, and I try and say it out loud because there's power in your throat. Pause. <laughs> 
sorry. <laughs> I try and say it out loud. And initially when I started saying it, I was like, shut up. No, you don't. <laughs> but you have to like really call it talking yourself into it. Talk, Call it reframing, reprogramming, getting over the limiting beliefs. Because there are people who are like, I don't like working out. Now I do. And I'm like, how? And I just was like, well, I'm just going to start telling myself, you love this. You love this. I love working out. I feel so good. And I and I feel way more accomplished when I finish my workout. Like before I was like, yeah, yeah, it was good for me. Okay. <laughs> but now but now I'm like, yeah, I did that shit. And I feel real good about myself now. I just need to like talk myself into doing that more frequently. But so I've started doing that. I've also started saying some affirmations in the morning, like my stomach is flat, my waist is snatched. I weigh and I put in the weight that I want to be. That ain't none of y'all's business, but (laughs) (laughs) my stomach is flat, my waist is snatched, and I go about my day. And so I'm just trying to, look, I'm attacking this from all fronts, okay? The physical, the mental of getting myself to the workout and the spiritual of adjusting this realm that I'm in to reach my desired destination. The last thing that I will say, and this is something that I'm just now starting to do my research on, but I saw this on TikTok, of course. I saw this on TikTok where I've seen started seeing videos of people talking about how the 24-hour circadian rhythm is patriarchal in the sense that men's hormones, the ups and downs of their hormones of how they like wake up and then they kind of crash in the afternoon or then they're, you know, they kind of want to get cuddly at night, that that 24 hours of like how our days flow is based off of how men's hormones go through their body. And women, their hormones are based on their 28-ish because not everybody has a 28-day cycle. And so how our hormones are released through that 28-day cycle can determine a lot of things. I've seen people apply how you create, like how you come up with ideas, when you execute on them, when you rest, all of that based on a 28-day cycle, which is very different from how we attack like normal work. Then I saw a TikTok where they actually said that you should apply what types of workouts that you do based on your 28-day cycle. And basically, you should like hit the gym hard from day one of your period through ovulation. And then from ovulation until your period starts, you should do like more yoga, more Pilates, maybe some strength training, but like not a lot of intervals, not a lot of like, you know, where you're breathing real heavy and like you feel like your heart's going to explode. Maybe that's how I feel. I love working out. I love working out. (laughs) And so now all of this to say, if you're on birth control, I guess, I guess you just follow the circadian rhythm. I don't know. I mean, you don't really ovulate when you're on birth control. So your hormones aren't, it's supposed to like even out your hormones. So I don't think you really go through these hormonal cycles, so to speak. But if you're not on birth control and I'm not, then it might be something to test out. They were saying that if you're in that back half after you ovulate and you're doing these really intense workouts, your body, because of the hormones that it's releasing, because your body's trying to figure out, are we pregnant or are we like about to go into period mode? So there's a lot hormonal going on. So you might actually be doing yourself a disservice in your workouts by going super hard all the time. It's particularly in that back half, and you might actually be turning your carbs into fat, I think. And that's what we don't want to do if we're working out. So all very interesting. I read an article about it. I'll put it in the show notes. And yeah, very fascinating. Mm. All right. Thanks for that, Jen. Are you ready to do some breath work? I am. What am I processing today? No. Something I've been talking to Mick a lot of times when we're juggling the kids and our own work obligations and then the podcast and all of the different things that we have going on. And sometimes I'll say, I just need time to think. I just need like 30 minutes to think and I can I can get to that, that one thing. 
or, you know, I can finish that research for the podcast or I can finish out this assignment. I just need nothing like trying to get my attention for 30 minutes to an hour. And I find myself when I don't have that time very quickly getting overwhelmed. And what I'm realizing is not only is it the time to like really just think and be solely focused on one thing without being distracted, but it's also coming back into your body. And we talked about this before, about all of the the myriad of things that are trying to get your attention and this email and that text and what you want to do, what you need to do, and how you're just dividing yourself up during the day. And so I really just wanted to not necessarily pull our energy back, but just like just be in our body. This is probably going to be a very simple breath work, but just like taking the time to stop and chill and freeze. All right. So we're going to do our usual three deep cleansing breaths. Close your eyes. Inhale in through your nose. Expanding your belly. And sigh that breath out through your mouth. Focusing only on my voice, let's inhale in through your nose. Feeling every percentage of that inhale as you get to 100%, all of that breath. And then sigh that breath out through your mouth. Let's do that again. Inhale in through your nose. Releasing your shoulders. We're going to seal our lips and exhale out through your nose. Now that we've taken those three deep breaths, I want you to Check in with your body. See how your body's feeling. Where are you tense? Give yourself permission to just be still in this moment. Can you relax yourself a little bit further? And if any thoughts, any to-dos, oh, I, sh- oh, I need to text that person, I need to email that person back, just observe those thoughts and let them slide by. Reminding yourself that nothing is more important than this present moment. Take a breath together. Inhale in through your nose. Sigh this one out through your mouth. Just letting yourself be in your body. Inhale in through your nose. Sigh this one out of your mouth. We're going to finish with gratitude. So just allow yourself to feel the gratitude for your body, for your mind, carrying you through the day, juggling all of your to-dos. And thanking yourself for giving yourself this time to just be still. All right. Thanks so much for that, Jen. 
let's get into our main topic. Today, we wanted to talk about a concept, something that can control our actions, something that most of us feel from time to time, and that's the emotion of fear. This is a topic that comes up often in religion and spirituality. Fear of God, fear as an indicator of a lack of faith, fear as a way to keep us inhibited. These are all things that have come up in various texts and concepts that we have read about and explored. Yeah, so in this episode, we wanted to take a deep dive into what fear is and the impact that it can have on us in our lives. First, we love a definition. And I love defining things that we, if someone said define fear, you'd be like, I don't know, scared of something. What does that mean? You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like when you know what it is. Yeah. Well, let's dive into it. So what is fear? From the Oxford Dictionary, fear is an unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that someone or something is dangerous, likely to cause pain or a threat. I'd like to also include that it's an emotion caused by the belief that someone or something is likely to cause pain or discomfort because the fear of being uncomfortable is definitely a thing. Yeah, definitely. I think one of the kind of spiritual buzzwords or phrases that we've all heard, and it really relates to fear, it's like this idea of vibrating high or good vibrations. I mean, we kind of talked about that in our like toxic positivity episode, right? Mm -hmm. Like good vibes and whatnot. And I think people a lot of times will use that to kind of like mask, mask their fear. Mm. So I wanted to talk a little bit about like what vibrations and good vibrations are really all about. And so if you really kind of go back and look at some of like the laws of the universe, the natural laws, uh, the Kybalion is a book that kind of goes over these, these laws or the hermetic principles. One of them is the principle of vibration. And it basically says that nothing is at rest and that everything vibrates. We know from science, you know, this makes sense. Like just kind of thinking, taking a step back, macro level, we are on this large rock in our solar system that is moving constantly around the sun. And then looking at it at a very micro level, going all the way down to subatomic particles, we're talking about electrons being constantly in motion, moving around the nucleus of an atom. So if everything is made up of these atoms, then that means we're all constantly vibrating. So the rate that a vibration occurs, that causes a wave. And that can be either in the material or as part of the electromagnetic field. And the rate that that is vibrating is called the frequency. Low frequencies are slower and look a lot like a very chill wave, kind of big and fewer valleys and peaks. High frequencies, they are faster, much quicker peaks and valleys and more waves. And kind of thinking about the context, you know, we hear people say we should vibrate high, it would seem that that higher vibrations are more positive, right? So scientists have actually been able to confirm this when they have studied the exact frequency of human emotions. So the more positive emotions like peace, love, joy, those have much higher frequencies than emotions like shame, guilt, and today's topic, fear. For a direct comparison, joy has a frequency of 540 hertz. Fear, on the other hand, only has a frequency of 100 hertz. And so when you think about it, some of our colloquialisms on how we talk about like our emotions actually track to this scientific explanation. So when you're like, I'm down in the dumps, like you're in a low frequency type state, you're feeling sad, you might be fearful, you might feel guilty about something versus like, I'm on cloud nine, I'm, I'm out here feeling great. And even think about like when you're in an amazing mood, how much lighter do you feel? And feeling lighter means like you're kind of floating, you're high, maybe not in that sense, but <laughs> <laughs> you're in a higher frequency. And it actually, thinking through this, it actually made me think of this really cool TikTok that I saw where the person was saying that science, religion, and spirituality are just three different ways of trying to explain our existence. Mm -hmm. And that 
we see and we try and bridge the gap, I think, on this on our show, the overlap, right? Mm -hmm. Of we're scientifically able to understand emotions. The spiritual girls are out here talking about vibrate high, good vibes, Mm -hmm. increase your frequency. And we're saying the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. It's all very interesting to me. Like we're just trying to wrap our arms around our life that we're living. So let's dive a little bit more into fear. Specifically, some common areas in your life where we can all experience fear. So first, the fear of change, fear of the unknown, whether that's changing jobs, moving, life transitions. I think this is one that's been big for Jen and I. Mm, you want to get into it? Yeah, let's talk a little bit about it. I think first, for me, changing jobs, right? Mm. That's one that I think for me has been a source of a lot of fear. Mm. I think I talked about this. The guys that were at the retreat will will recognize this this little speech. But I, I think when I was in corporate America and working a, a typical nine to five job, it was something that I felt like I was trained for. Mm. Going to school, getting good grades, going to college, getting good grades, going to grad school, whatever, whatever. And then you move into corporate life. It's like, that's like the natural progression. Progression, exactly. But now as I've entered into this more, I'd say feminine energy space and with spirituality, mm-hmm. it's not something that you get taught, you know, in the traditional sense of like going to school and getting a test and then you get a good grade or whatever, right? Like it's a very different process. A lot of intuition is involved. A lot of going within and sitting with your emotions and your own thoughts and really like meditating very deeply. And so in some ways, I've felt like a lot of fear around if I'm qualified to be doing the work that I'm doing, Mm. right? And it requires a letting go of that fear to really allow myself to be successful when I'm working with people. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's one one way fear has, you know, in terms of fear of change and, and a new job has affected me. Secondly, Jen and I are planning for a big move. Mm-hmm. And there is a lot of fear that we've had to overcome in this. You guys know we live in Texas right now. Both of us were born and raised in Texas. Mm-hmm. I have spent some time going to school in, in different states, but I'd say the majority of my life has been spent living in Texas. And yeah, we are moving to Southern California in a couple of months. That's my internal voice. (laughs) (laughs) And it's been a a, a long process. We've been talking about this for well over a year. We've been prepping our family and friends like, hey, this is going to be happening. And I think a lot of people have asked us questions that are very reasonable questions. Mm -hmm. Why are you guys moving? What are you guys going to do for work? Yeah. Where are you going to live? And like all of these kind of, you know, very reasonable questions again. And I think for us, we don't have like a very concrete answer. I know. As to why it is we're moving. There's a lot of different answers and some of them fall within kind of the spiritual space where it's like we just feel this calling to be in this space. And we've heard that confirmation come from our spiritual advisors. Right. And so we are going with it we're literally just like having faith that that is the place where we're supposed to be and that the right opportunities will present themselves for us to be successful when we get there did i kind of summarize it yes what else would you want to add to that when certain people have asked us those questions and we know that we don't have a quote-unquote good answer that is Traditional. I guess that's the way that I would say it, you know, because I think what people are expecting is that, oh, I got a really great opportunity to go work at this job. Yes. Oh, Twitter hired me and they're going to move me out there. Yes. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Their rational mind can wrap themselves around that and it's like, oh, OK, yeah. you're taken care of. Like everything's going to be OK. This is how things are supposed to proceed. And this makes sense. Mm -hmm. But then we're just like, we just wanted to live there. That's what we tell people who we might not feel comfortable being like, you know, we've really been called to move there. Yeah. Some of those people are Christians who should understand that. Like, I think like in the black church, like, I feel called to do this. I feel like this is, you know, 
But for some reason, sometimes I'm not comfortable sharing that. But the fear creeps in because you know you're doing something out of the traditional Mm -hmm. and some of that old conditioning pops in because people are like, wait, what? And then you're like, am I crazy? Mm -hmm. Which that just is my whole like, what is the truth? Mm -hmm. And having to come back to myself Mm -hmm. and figuring out what the truth is for me and then checking in with Mick and being like, are we aligned? And then just moving forward, right? Like it's us against the world. Absolutely. (laughs) But yeah, every step of it, can create new fear. We almost got scammed yesterday. Mm-hmm. We thought we found the perfect house for us to rent. And long story short, we sent our application. He's like, oh, you're accepted. Like, almost immediately. Yeah. Send me $15,000. Wait, I'm sorry. What? Where's my lease? Yeah. We haven't done a walkthrough. Like, yeah. what are you talking about? And meanwhile... Mick and I, our spidey senses start tingling. We do our own Googles. I'm in the wife's Instagram. The person I'm emailing is like, oh, I can't do a video call because I asked to meet them. Like, I'd love to meet you. Oh, I can't do a video call. Here's a picture of my family. That's not their family. Mm -mm. Because I'm already (laughs) elbows deep in this man's real LinkedIn, his wife's real Instagram. And I know they only got one baby. So why you send me a picture with two and the man's face has clearly been Photoshopped. It was a mess. But yeah. So then you can easily in that moment say, you know what? I can't. Yeah, I can't. Yeah. It's easier for me to be where I'm comfortable and stay where I am and just forget it. Yeah. I think also just like our family, you know, they, they're very concerned. They have a lot of fear around us moving and being away. Mm-hmm. Um, they both are here in Texas. So that'll be interesting how this all, all plays out. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about some of the other common fears. Fear of failure. I think this kind of wraps into what we just talked about with the fear of change, right? When that change comes, like, are you going to fail? Mm-hmm. Fear of success. This is one I wanted to actually spend some time on because I know this is something that came up for Jen when we had a human design reading. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Do you want to talk a little bit about that one? There's my internal voice again. (laughs) It's such a weird fear. That was, that was almost, that was like a year and a half ago. Yeah. That I'm still trying to like really get a grasp of what it is because like, why would you be afraid to succeed? But I think what is at the heart of it is what would have to change? Mm -hmm. What would have to change for you to succeed? What would you have to do? And sometimes that step into that or what you might have to leave behind, that can be a lot. Sometimes it's what, what would others have to say and what others opinions of you are can weigh on you just as much when you're successful as when you're a failure, Mm -hmm. you know? Like, I am afraid of haters. Not that I, you know, and and here I go, not that I think I'm doing anything, but I mean, you know what I mean? Like, attracting attention to yourself that someone may hate on that. Mm -hmm. Like, I hate how people talk to Meg Thee Stallion. Yeah. I'm not trying to win a Grammy or anything, but I hate the way that people talk about her. Yeah. Just just because she is, all eyes are on her. Mm-hmm. And sometimes there's fear there, right? More people are going to be looking at me. And yeah. I prefer to kind of move how I want to move. So it's a very interesting one to unpack because in your head, you're like, no, of course I want to be successful. Of course I want to accomplish these things. Of course I want to, I want what I want. But then some, you just have to unpack it for yourself. Because sometimes I think I'm like, I don't want recognition and what what is why what is that yeah and i think it's i don't want the attention necessarily i just want to do what i do Mm -hmm. and that's interesting yeah i think you almost have to pull apart like is it selflessness or is it fear yeah i mean (laughs) let's have therapy with jen today i used to win a lot of awards growing up as, as a kid I was always aiming for perfect attendance and I was a really good student. And so award ceremonies would come and I was sweet. Yeah. When I was in middle school and my keyboarding teacher, I'm a beast. I'm a beast typer. Okay. Maybe speaking, ain't got nothing on me. Okay. (laughs) And this is, I don't know if we have any like younger listeners. Who don't know what that is? <laughs> we had, first of all, yeah, do you not know who Mavis Beacon is? <laughs> Software to teach you how to type. 
But also... A black lady, by the way. A black lady, which I thought was... <laughs> this is sad. I thought that was so dope. I know. Because we didn't have a black president. <laughs> okay. She was teaching us how to type, though. She was teaching us how to type. I was like, they put a black lady on this? I, too, can be a great typer. And I was. <laughs> but we had keyboarding class. And it was like a room with just old-ass typewriters. That's how we learned how to type. Did you have keyboarding class with, like, typewriters? Nah, we had we had PCs. Dang, you're older than me. Uh, y'all didn't have the funding then. No. Ghetto. <laughs> <laughs> we learned on typewriters, so it wasn't no delete. It was <laughs> your mistake was on your paper. <laughs> and that's how I learned how to type. I was the best typist in the class, and my keyboarding teacher pulled me to the side and said, Jennifer, you're winning too many awards at the award ceremony. You are the best typist in the class of all the eighth graders. You're the best, but you're winning entirely too many awards. And so we're going to give this award to Susie Q. Susie Q was my friend. That was my good girlfriend. Okay. So I was like, oh, okay. Because I'm naive. Yeah. And sharing is caring, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> so I was like, okay, you know. Yeah. This was probably within the past year that that story popped up in my head. And I was like, that little heifer. Now, I deserve that award. I should have gotten that award. Yeah. The award was mine. Yeah. We don't need to bring up certain cards or anything in this. Yeah, but, yeah. you know, it did give me a side eye. Mm-hmm. And then I told my mother about it. And she was like, why are you just now telling me about this? She was pissed. Okay. Oh my goodness. She was hot. She was like, why are you just? I was like, because I was still a child. I was like 12. Yeah. It was very manipulative of that heifer to do that. And I didn't think anything of it because I was a child yeah. and I was naive. And this was someone that I trusted and someone that I respected. Yeah. And so it wouldn't even occur to me to come home and tell my mother that story. Yeah. But anyways, what that may have taught me, coming back to the original reason why I'm telling this story, is that when you get awards, it attracts negative attention. And... It appears that you're doing this for your own self edification. Mm. And awards are something that you should not want Mm -hmm. because it might bring you the attention that you don't want. Interesting. So maybe, maybe that's where all of this swirls in my design and in my psyche. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about another one of the common areas where people face a lot of fear. And that one is the fear of the worst case scenario. I think for me, as someone who is an Enneagram 6, I can really relate to this one. We talked back in our Enneagram episode, really just about kind of like the shadow aspects that certain numbers in the Enneagram deal with. And fear is a big one for folks who are 6 in the Enneagram. And so I know for me, I spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, what could possibly go wrong. And I'm always trying to like be prepared for it. That we talked about how like the six is often like the Boy Scout and they're like, when this happens, like we need to make sure we have this tool or this thing that we can use to solve that problem. And so I think I spent a lot of mental energy just like kind of trying to combat that fear, which mm-hmm. can can be exhausting at a time. Mm-hmm. But yeah, what are your thoughts on that one? I probably experienced this one. This one probably like kicked up for me after having our first daughter. Mm. And I started having a lot of anxiety and fear around just regular day to day stuff. Like I'm driving home from work and I'm like, what if I get into a car accident? What if something happens to me? You know, she's not going to have a mom and just like spiraling out Mm -hmm. on how I could be in some type of freak accident, something happens, God forbid somebody comes in and shoots up the place, and how paralyzing that is. Yeah. I think I try to reframe it as I want to take care of myself so that I can be here for her. But that takes a lot of work, right? Yeah, I mean, it can really, really mess with you, I think. Uh, There was a couple that you told me about that they would never take the same flight yes because they were just fearful of if that plane went down they would want one of them to still be yeah it was a guy i worked with said him and his wife never took they never flew together anywhere yeah maybe she just didn't want to be around him because he got on my nerves but (laughs) and that's what she told him 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> I need to be in business by myself. <laughs> That's terrible. Surely not. Uh, the last one I wanted to talk about was the fear of rejection. So I think a lot of people deal with this, right? Like yeah. applying for a new job, going up to that cute girl that you've been eyeing for a while and talking to her, applying to the school you want to go to. Mm-hmm. It'd be a lot of different things. Also social media. Yeah. And is the rejection the absence of likes? Mm. an engagement what does that look like i i'm also interested in probably because i'm dealing with this myself after being inside for so long because of covid and not doing all of the day-to-day activities and interacting not being at work et cetera, et cetera, mm-hmm. the amount of social anxiety that people have yeah And what does that look like now? Like, if you're already, like, feeling a little out of body interacting with people, Mm -hmm. like, just the casual day-to-day conversations that you have with people in person, because the frequency of those may have gone down for you. Yeah. What takes its place? Is it, like, am I being awkward? Are they not feeling me what does that look like and if you already had a little bit of fear of rejection is that heightened yeah yeah it's really interesting because i think sometimes you'll get the tidbits from tiktok of people saying like be yourself be your fullest self and screw the people who don't accept you for you or whatever and so then you can tell yourself that and try and get over your fear of rejection And then if you're me, you have the fear that you're not self-aware enough of the places that probably don't need to be so loud and that people are rejecting that and that maybe, you know what I mean? And then you just get into this cycle, this super fun cycle. One thing that's really interesting, you can also find fears on your human design chart, specifically in your spleen center. Quick note, if you have not listened to our human design episodes, go back to episodes 31 through 33 and 35 through 37 to get caught up, get all the details, run your chart. For those who are familiar with human design, a quick refresh. The spleen center is that triangle in the bottom left of your chart. And the spleen holds our primal fears for our survival and well-being. And how it operates is based on fear. But in the sense, not necessarily that like you're scared all the time, but fear does bring about an amount of awareness and alertness. To my earlier point, most of the time I would commute from work mindlessly, you know, almost subconsciously sometimes. You ever drive and then be like, oh, how do you get home? Because your mind was somewhere completely different. But that fear, I was like, oh, look at that person. Oh, they might sideswipe me. Oh, that mer-. But it made me more alert. It probably wasn't really good for my system, but we'll get into that. So just think of your spleen as it's what it's watching out for you. It's watching. It's looking for all of the boogeymen and all of the what ifs and the things that you need to avoid. So it's that primal area of ourselves that wants to make sure that we survive. And so each of the gates in the spleen center represent a primary fear for survival. So look at the gates in your chart in the spleen that are in bold, if you have any, and see if any of these fears ring true for you. And so the numbers are going to be in the order of how they flow on the gate itself. Starting with gate 48, fear of inadequacy. This is the fear that you don't have what it takes. It's the imposter syndrome gate. Maybe you find yourself constantly seeking depth in a subject. I got to learn more. I got to learn more before I can ever talk about this. Or you're doing the absolute most to prove to yourself and others that you belong in your position. You know, it's like you could just do the job, but you do like 200 percent more just to prove that you're qualified. Sound familiar? Gate 57, fear of the future. We talk about this one a lot, and it's the fear of what's coming next. So are you holding back because you're so afraid of what's up ahead? Are you over-saving? 
and never treating yourself because of fear of what could happen. Like, there are plenty of people who are like, no, I have to save. I have to save. I have to save. Well, why don't you go on vacation? Oh, I'll go on vacation. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to go, but I have to save. And then they never take vacation. And you can't take the money with you, child, when you die. Not to be morbid, but just think about, I think that was the easiest example that I could come up with. But just think of like where you might be holding back from actually living. I think a lot of people work, 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 and they're like, oh, I'll live when I retire. But probably because they're afraid of losing their job. They're afraid of what that future looks like. So they suffocate and suppress other parts of themselves out of fear. Gate 44, fear of the past. The fear itself, that fear of the past, may be that you're afraid of your past baggage catching up with you, which is interesting because if you've truly healed from whatever that was, are you afraid that it's going to come back again, that you're going to fall back on it, that it's going to resurface? Is it a secret? Is it something that you're ashamed of? So that, that one may be interesting. Are you reinventing yourself so no one finds out about the old you? So continuing on with the gates in the spleen, there's gate 50, which is the fear of responsibility. This fear can manifest with you either being afraid to step up and take on more responsibility or you're taking on too much because you're afraid of maybe not having that control and that if you don't get it done, you're scared that it either won't get done or it won't be done as well as you would have. Gate 32 is the fear of failure. We talked about this one earlier, but this fear holds you back from doing what you want to do. So kind of think about what are you telling yourself that you can or cannot be changed or accomplished? Then there's gate 28, which is the fear of death slash purpose. This can manifest with you either being afraid your life has no purpose or maybe you know what you're supposed to be doing and you're afraid of that purpose and the risks that, you know, you might have to take to actually step into that purpose. Then gate 18 is the fear of authority. And this one is really about fearing being judged by others or a lot of self-judgment. These are really interesting. When I read these and like looked at my chart, I was like, drag me, <laughs> drag me for Phil. And then I told Mick his and he walked out of the room very quickly. <laughs> if you have a defined spleen, and that means the entire triangle is colored in, you must listen to your gut instinct. That little whisper that tells you what's right for you. You don't really know where it came from. If you remember from our human design episodes, it's not going to repeat itself. You just know or you just feel or something tells you something. Listen to that. That's why it's important to find that time to just sit and think. Going back to our breath work, like finding that time to just be in your body with no distractions. Sometimes I'm like, oh, I'm just going to read something on my phone or I'm just going to like play a game on my phone. I'm relaxing, but you're still distracted. You're not still and you're not aware of what's in your body. And the more that you strengthen that, the better that is for you. You definitely also want to listen to your human design authority. And that's your instinct that's really going to help you work around your fears. I found that once I started exploring what felt true in my body, that I had a stronger concept and a stronger handle of what my truth was. And I feel that on my personal journey, a lot of it has been trying to get to the root of what's real and like what's true and realizing how much gaslighting is all around us. Like corporate America to me is just like gaslight central. Like they just gaslight the hell out of you and <laughs> all the time. <laughs> and it's like, we're a team. And, but like, the actions do not reflect being a team. And like, this is a family-oriented place. But like, you're calling me at 6 p.m. when I'm trying to like give my kids dinner, you know? And so really like getting back to what's in my body, like how do I feel and and what does my body do when this certain person calls me or when this person tells me something or or when I feel that someone's trying to tell me that my version of reality is not the truth. Like, where do, where do I feel that in my body? What do I do? Do I recoil? Do I sit back? Like, really listening to that. Really pay attention to that. 
if you have an undefined spleen, so meaning the spleen center is white, but you have defined gates in bold, the fears that are in bold in those gates can be magnified. However, if you have a completely open spleen, meaning your spleen center is completely white with no defined gates, you could operate in two extremes. Either you're afraid of everything, which can prevent you from doing anything, or you're afraid of nothing, which, you know, can make you quite reckless. (laughs) The advice is the same for people with undefined and open spleen centers. So you need to face your fears one by one so that you can become fearless in a healthy way. Like, if you think that you're not afraid of anything, like, just, like, really look at the fears and say, like, okay, this is how I'm going to manage through this. You want to learn from your fear and do not try to suppress it or pretend that it isn't there. Because you're open to conditioning and open to the influences of others, you want to really start examining what feelings are yours and what you're picking up from others. Examine your personal relationships. Are you looking to them? And this could be parent-child. This could be romantic relationships, friends. Are you looking to these people to make you less afraid? They could have a defined spleen. And you're allowing their ability to project well-being and courage to condition you. So you have to remember that you have to face your fears yourself. Because if you're looking to someone else to do it for you, that can create unhealthy relationships and et cetera, et cetera. Finally, you also want to make sure you're following your human design authority and strategy so you're not making rash decisions. You can get caught up in the influence of others. And being spontaneous is not a bad thing, but it is if it's brought on by somebody else. So you want to make sure that you're operating on your own, in your own truth, off your own instincts, off your own gut. And so it's like really about coming back to self. So let's get into how fear can impact us, starting with the physical. So let's go back to when fear was crucial for survival. We've talked about this on previous episodes before, but back in prehistoric times, we were out here, you know, hunting and gathering. There was all types of threats around us. We needed to have a healthy amount of fear to keep us from getting attacked by a saber-toothed tiger or something random rolling up on us, right? (laughs) But nowadays... You know, fear has become much more complex. Yes, there are certainly fears regarding our personal safety, but we also have fear around the issues that we talked about earlier, right? And the problem is our body can't really distinguish between our fear of failure and fears about our physical safety. And so we end up living in this state of fear that can trigger that fight or flight hormone response. And it floods our systems with adrenaline, and cortisol as it prepares us for this this fight or this flight. So when your body gets into that state, it's not really worried about things like your long-term immunity, for example. So that's kind of the first thing to go. The cortisol gives you a boost of glucose to give you energy to fight off the lion. But over time, this can contribute to elevated blood sugar levels. So things like diabetes pop up. And even thinking about like that long-term immunity piece, I think about COVID, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of fear that's out there around COVID. And so it makes me wonder like how much of that fear is contributing to the like susceptibility of people to not be able to like fight it off, right? Like if our fear is triggering that fight or flight response and our long-term immunity is being deteriorated, are we more susceptible to falling ill to COVID? Because of our fear of COVID. Ugh. And how could we even scientifically measure that? I have no idea. But it, it just came to me right now as we were like going through this. Like, I just remember the stories when COVID first hit and it was like, oh, this guy was, you know, 34. He ran three miles every day and he got COVID. And he was dead in two weeks. Yeah. And... Of course, that triggered a lot of fear in me. For sure. Because, baby, I don't run. Yeah. I'm not in peak physical condition. And it's like, oh, it took this person out who yeah. we expected to be way more healthy than yeah. that. 
Now, of course, we don't know what his diet looks like, and we definitely don't know what his emotional, mental, and spiritual life looks like. We don't know what his stressors were. Yeah. So it's interesting, and it's something that I'm exploring a lot, I feel like, right now, of how much weight we give the physical body. Mm -hmm. When what I'm somewhat discovering is... The physical is the last thing Mm -hmm. of what we can visually measure and manifest. If that's what I mean, if that makes sense. Yeah. That we have all of these things that are going on inside of us. And sure, diet and exercise and rest, those physical things that we do to take care of ourselves are important. But yeah, like I I think we really discount the impact of the spiritual and emotional. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about that. So in my work as an energy healer, I've become a lot more aware of how fear lives in the body. So I'm treating people. Mm. I'm, you know, using my hands to feel their different energies coming off their aura and their different chakras. And particularly in the heart and in the solar plexus, I can feel energetically some of these fears, the fear of rejection, the fear of starting over romantically or in friendships, Mm. the fear of acceptance and that solar plexus, like the lack of self-confidence and that blockage of energy that happens when you have this strong fear of being accepted in a social setting, right? Those are manifesting in our energetic bodies. And yeah, it's just sitting there. And so we have to, to work really hard to try to clear those and to heal and to let go of some of that fear. And even if you're still skeptical, like listening to everything that we just said, like, just think about ulcers. People are like, you're so stressed, you gave yourself an ulcer. Mm-hmm. That's wild. That's wild. I'm worried about what these yahoos at work are doing. So much that my stomach hurt. That's crazy. Not only does it hurt, you have a hole in your intestines. You literally, your mental stress burned a hole in your intestines. Yes. Yeah. What? Yeah. A terrible story, and we haven't talked about it. On the show, it just happened. It was, gosh, the shooting in Uvalde, the elementary school. And one of the adults that died, husband, they were high school sweethearts, had been married for 24 years. Husband has a fatal heart attack. Like the grief alone Mm -hmm. and just the heartbreak alone. Our spiritual and emotional concept of heartbreak manifested physically. And he had a fatal heart attack Mm -hmm. and dropped dead. Yeah. That is a terrible story, of course, and I feel terrible for the family. It just makes you think of, I think even when we hear stories of that and we accept them to be true, we still think of them as extremes. But really taking a moment to think through your daily stresses, your little fears, or your big fears, the things that annoy you. You get so mad over an email, it gives you a headache. Those things accumulate and they matter. I think we discount all of those emotions and those feelings. And we really have to start thinking about it as part of our overall wellness and its impact on our bodies. So on that note, the mental impact of fear. What you need to key into here is what are you telling yourself when you're afraid? So you're scared to leave your job because your boss or your team at the new job may be worse than the situation that you're currently in. Do you believe that you deserve to be in a better situation? Why are you so afraid and why do you think that this opportunity that you're interested in is going to not work out for you? Is there something you need to unpack there about what you think you deserve? Do you think you deserve to be somewhere better? You actually may start talking yourself into sticking with what you got. But is that at the expense of your self-worth? Are you advocating Mm. for yourself? And fear can be very paralyzing. While you think that you're playing it safe or smart, there's always a line between being risk averse and being so scared that you just can't do anything. Some people talk about analysis paralysis. This comes up a lot in the entrepreneur space of like, 
I'm looking at my numbers. I'm looking at my numbers. I'm looking at my numbers, but you don't do anything. You don't buy anything. You don't, I don't want to be part of LLC Twitter, but you don't set up your <laughs> LLC. <laughs> you don't like take that next step. You're just sitting there looking at spreadsheets for deals that you haven't done that you're never going to do because you're too scared to pull the trigger. You can even convince yourself, because this has happened to me, that if you haven't found the reason to not do something, like if you're sitting there looking at like, oh, okay, I'm going to enter into this business venture. It looks great on paper. I think I'm going to make a gazillion dollars. It's going to be fantastic. Fear can tell you, oh, you haven't seen where this is going to fail. Oh, you're so dumb. (laughs) You would be an idiot to enter into this because you have not found the very clear gaping hole of failure that you're probably going to jump into like a dum-dum. So we talked a little bit about body and mind. Let's end with the spiritual impact of fear. So back in episode 29, we talked about the law of attraction. Earlier, we talked about the frequency of fear. And we also covered the law of vibration, which also goes back to episode 29. And it's really important that when you're trying to attract the things that you want into life, that you are matching the vibration of those things. So you want a promotion, you want to attract financial abundance, you want a new romantic partner, you need to aim for a higher vibration so that those things that you want will match your vibration. If you are If you are vibrating in fear, hanging out at those lower vibrations, hanging out at 100 hertz, for example, you're not going to be able to attract the things that you are really wanting to bring into your life. If we take the goal of moving away from the lower denser emotions, we can aim to keep ourselves in that higher, more elevated state. All of this being said, we want to make sure that we're remembering the lessons that we learned from our Toxic Positivity episode that emotions are part of the human experience and fear is one of those emotions. So even though we're saying like, oh, vibrate higher and you have to, fear is going to keep you limited. It's going to paralyze you. I think that people think that they should just be like, okay, well, I don't, I'm not afraid of that. And fear is real and it's part of the human experience. Yeah. It's not about being fearless, right? It's about acknowledging the fear and moving on from it. Mm -hmm. You can't just stay in that fear energy. I think about that show Big Mouth. Mm -hmm. I think his name is the shame monster, but it's kind of like the same idea where he's like pushing shame on everybody and trying to keep everybody in like that same like shame energy. It's kind of the same idea with fear, right? We, We can't get stuck in this funk of fear. We have to acknowledge it and move on beyond it. Mm hmm. I've sometimes felt shame about feeling fear. Mm, mm. (laughs) And what a fun journey that was. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, same thing. I realized I needed to look at it, examine it. Examine what it really meant. Was it even true? And then move forward with what I wanted to do. Knowing that there might be discomfort, but really trying to focus on what was on the other side of that. Right. That the experience and the and the achievement that I was trying to get to was way better than where I currently was. I think that's what kept me moving through that because I can really struggle with fear of change and being uncomfortable. I remember hearing once that courage is being afraid, but doing it anyways. And that really stuck with me because I think people think of people who are they think are courageous as being fearless to your point, but it's not about not having fear. So the goal isn't to be without fear. Those people are psychopaths, like literally. (laughs) Sorry if we have any psychopathic listeners, don't come after me. But the goal is to be courageous. I think I would also challenge each of us to examine when we're feeling in those denser emotions, those lower vibrations, and it doesn't on the surface look like fear and really unpack it for ourselves as to why we're acting that way. 
for instance, how someone lashing out is really a cover for them being hurt. I think sometimes that same lashing out or even when someone's like, oh, you can't do that. Or are you sure you want to do that? And you feel like they're just trying to hate or drag you down. They may be afraid for you. Mm. And really examining our own impulses and others and what that comes from and what are they afraid of? What are you afraid of? And like, could it be possible that you've come up with a very long list of criteria for your potential romantic partner that no one would ever fulfill because you're afraid? Mm. Are you picky? You don't want to settle or are you afraid of being vulnerable in a romantic situation. Mm. That's my challenge. That's deep, Jen. We're going to get out of here on that note. As always, folks, if you have a question, shoot us an email. We've been getting some great emails and DMs recently. Mm -hmm. You can also find us on Instagram and YouTube and TikTok. And if you'd like to join our Chakras and Shotguns community, you can support us on Patreon. Finally, if you're loving the show, Please subscribe and give us a five-star review wherever you listen. Namaste. Namaste.